This talk comes in two parts. Part one is about witch hunting in the 17th and 18th century, and we use some examples from Hertfordshire and also specifically from decorum. Part two is called Ghosts and Hauntings, which also are in the 17th and 18th century, but also a bit from the 19th century, and again using local examples. So part one is witch hunting in the 17th and 18th century decorum. So in this section, we're going to cover a few things. So first of all, the history of the fear of witches in those days. Um, secondly, what the different causes of witch hunts were. Um, who were targeted by witch hunts and how were they targeted? Um, how people tested the suspects with the way were witches. Um, the sorts of torture and execution that witches had to experience. Um, and then the end of witch hunts in England, how did they stop? And then we'll go over a few local examples of witchcraft histories in Hertfordshire. So why were people scared of witches? Well, the term magic was used right from pr prior to the Middle Ages, really, to describe what the church ruled as inappropriate sacred rituals. Those practicing them were considered to be in league with the devil. Some of these rituals had even come from pre-Christian pagan practices, but they still remained popular in communities. In the Middle Ages, people often consulted witches and wise folk, but many feared them. They were accused of acts against people and livestock that were otherwise unexplainable in the era before scientific rationalisation. And this fear was built upon by fables of night flying, shape shifting, suckling demons, and generally witches' pacts with the devil. So what were the causes of the 17th and 18th century witch hunts? Well, it started a lot further back. So in 1486, a German Catholic clergyman called Heinrich Kramer wrote a book called The Malleus Maleficarum, or translated, that means the hammer of witches. It was a detailed and ultra-religious handbook on how to exterminate witchcraft and witches, but using the legal process to do so. It stated that magic was equivalent to heresy and that its proponents should be persecuted as such. It advocated the use of torture to extract confessions and the death penalty, specifically burning at the stake. This book had a strong influence on the culture of Europe for several centuries. Another reason for the ramping up of witch hunts at that time was James I of England, who was also, of course, James VI of Scotland. He was a real witch hater. He believed that witches were plotting to kill his wife, Anne of Denmark. And in 1599, he wrote a book called Demonology, which discredited necromancy and sorcery and called for the persecution of witches. So who were accused of being witches and how were they targeted? In the most part, it was women, often older women and poor, who made up 80% of those accused of witchcraft. However, their husbands and children could also find themselves in the dock. Many suspected witches were accused by their neighbours, often just because they had a grudge against them. Sometimes in extreme circumstances, Children would accuse their neighbours when under so-called diabolical possession. The child involved would get a lot of attention and a lot of status in the community, which was a real incentive for them and their family to accuse people of being witches. So there were various ways adopted of testing whether a suspected witch was in fact a witch, and all of them, as you'd imagine, were pretty unfair. The first and probably the most well known was trial by swimming, which is also called ducking, which you can see in the middle picture. Um, as witches were believed to reject baptism, the logic was that the water would reject them and that they would float and only the innocent would be accepted by the water and therefore sink. A second method was called trial by prayer. Witches were thought incapable of saying scripture aloud. So the accused were made to recite prayers and any mistakes they made were viewed as proof that they were in league with the devil. 
which as you can imagine, if they were very nervous in a courtroom, was something that was quite likely to happen. Thirdly, there was a touch test or very similarly, an incantation test. If the accused touch or incantations that they were forced to make brought a cursed person out of a fit, they were found guilty of having laid the curse in the first place. Many fake victims acted this out successfully to prove the suspect guilty. And the other well-known one was witch's marks. So witch hunters looked for the devil's mark. Now the devil's mark is an area of a skin which would be impervious to feeling, or sometimes took the form of an extra nipple, which they believe witches used to feed their familiars. And familiars were often things like cats or rats. Suspects were stripped and any mark on them would be interpreted exactly as how the accuser saw fit, which was obviously a very biased situation. Sometimes suspects would be pricked with sharp knives all over their bodies to find an invisible devil's mark. So witches were often tortured so that they would confess. Typically in England, Thumb screws or hot leg irons were used to try and extract confessions out of witches. However, in England, the number of witches executed was actually much lower than other countries with much more puritanical Christian beliefs. So just to give you an idea, in the two centuries between about 1563 and 1735, there were about 400 executions in England. And that compares to two and a half thousand in the same time in Scotland, which was a much more puritanical country. Overall, it's estimated that about 200,000 witches were executed or tortured in Europe between 1484 and 1700. And there were a lot more puritanical countries in Europe that helped boost that number, like Germany and Switzerland and places like that. Also, most executions in England tended to be hangings rather than the burning at the stake that was adopted again by the more puritanical countries. One of the most prolific witch hunters in England was a man called Matthew Hopkins, who was also known as the Witchfinder General. He was responsible for more people being hanged for witchcraft in three years than in the previous 100 years. He's believed to have been responsible for the executions of about 20% of alleged witches in England between the years of 1644 and 1646. For example, he had 68 people put to death in Bury St Edmunds alone and 19 hanged at Chelmsford in a single day. By the 1700s, witch hunts had started to become a big problem. So the Witchcraft Act of 1736 stated that to believe in witches was irreligious and therefore forbade witch hunting as an activity. Why would you need to hunt witches if witches didn't exist? The belief in magic and witches was so ingrained in the psyche of the community that the consultation of wise women and witches continued for a long time after that and witch denunciation therefore continued to carry on in communities hand in hand. So one of the most well-known examples of how that attitude continued in communities even after the Witchcraft Act of 1736 is a case that took place in Tring and Hemel, and that was the Ruth Osborne case. It took place in 1751, quite a while after the Witchcraft Act. Ruth Osborne and her husband, John, who were both over 70, were accused of witchcraft by their neighbours, specifically because she cursed a gobble-cut farmer for refusing her some buttermilk. His animals died not long after that, and he developed epilepsy. So the community decided they wanted revenge. Notices were put up in Winslow and in Hemel Hempstead that witches were to be tried by ducking at Longmaston on the 22nd of April, 1751. A mob gathered in Tring and found the couple who'd been hidden by the authorities for their own protection on that day. When they were found, they were stripped, their hands were tied to their toes and they were thrown into Longmaston Pool. 
Sadly, Ruth died from the ducking, although her husband John survived. So as I said, this incident took place quite a while after the Witchcraft Act of 1736. But the old traditions still persisted in communities and had been largely ignored by the authorities since the passing of the Act. But they wanted to make an example in Tring to deter future incidents. So they arrested the mob and one of its ringleaders, a chimney sweep called Thomas Coley, was hanged at Gabblecut Cross in Tring for the murder of Ruth Osborne. Because it had been almost unimaginable that people who killed witches had been executed in the past, at his execution many of the crowd were expressing their dismay at a man being executed for ridding the world of what they saw as an evil witch. One of the last people to be convicted of witchcraft in England actually lived in Hertfordshire. Jane Wenham, who lived in Walken, had had a reputation for being a troublesome widow, in inverted commas, and therefore was suspected as a witch, which was quite common. She was probably just an outspoken bit of a grumpy old woman that people didn't like. But what they used to do in that situation sometimes was accuse people like that of being witches. In 1712, she was finally formally accused of bewitching a neighbour of hers, a lady called Anne Thorne, and causing her to have fits. Because she was so unpopular, many neighbours gave evidence against her at her trial, and she failed the trial by prayer test that I mentioned earlier, and was there found, therefore found guilty and sentenced to death. Her sentence was commuted, but she had to be removed from her village for her own safety, and ended her days, in fact, living in peace in Hartingfordbury. And finally, there's another local case of witchcraft, um, and this took place in 1663 at Little Gaveston. A girl called Mary Hall was attended by a cunning man, or a wise man, who was called Dr Woodhouse, and he was from Berkhamsted, and he was called to rid her of a witch's curse. He clearly wasn't really a doctor, but that's what he called himself. She had exhibited sickness and fits. She'd been said to make animal noises and a voice supposedly spoke through her. He then examined her urine, which was again quite common in those days to look at urine when they were worried about health conditions generally. But he declared her bewitched and that the spirits of two local witches had possessed her. Dr Woodhouse placed her nail clippings in the chimney overnight to draw out the spirits. And he finally cured her by giving her an amulet to wear and a preparation to take. And the preparation was had quite a high percentage of opium. Again, a common tonic at that time. But that was said to have cured her from her witch's curse. Part two of this talk is called Ghosts and Hauntings in 17th, 18th and 19th century Hertfordshire. The examples in this presentation are made up of sightings that have been embedded in local folklore, but also some sightings that have just been reported by individuals. So in this section, we're gonna cover um, the history of why people believed in ghosts, what are ghosts or what were ghosts considered to be in those days? The language that was used around ghosts when it was discussed. Talking a bit about why ghosts were said to appear and when were ghosts said to appear. We're going to talk about the form that ghosts took in the 17th and 18th century. And then we'll go on to talk about the impact of ghost folklore on people and the kind of locations that hauntings tended to be reported in. And finally, a few examples of local historic ghost stories. So what was the history of the belief in ghosts in the 17th and 18th century? So before the birth of Protestant England, which happened in 1534 under Henry VIII, belief in ghosts was an inherent part of a traditional medieval Catholic culture. A central doctrine was that after death, souls were believed to suffer for their sins in purgatory before being allowed into heaven. 
In that way, souls could sometimes, therefore, make their way back into the living in the form of ghosts or spirits. When Henry VIII split with Rome in 1534, the English Reformation began and Protestant the theologians denounced superstitions that were identified with Catholic traditions, which should have meant the end of ghost belief. But instead, ghosts remain very much alive in the culture of English life for centuries. So what are ghosts in the context of the 17th and 18th centuries? Well, overall, historians define them as manifestations of the dead to a living person. They were a form of spirit and were often associated with fairies, devils and angels. A ghost could be visible or it could be invisible. But then when it was invisible, it could be heard, felt and even smelled. So the language that was used when talking about ghosts was quite specific and they had different names for different types of ghosts in the 17th and 18th century. James I, in his book Demonology, which he wrote in 1597, his first, the first thing he defined were wraiths, which was W-R-A-I-T-H-S, and he defined them as spirits that appeared at the very moment of a person's death. He called the spirits of the dead who actually haunted and stayed around for a while, he called them lemures or spectra and highlighted their hideous looks and their unpleasant noises that they made. A philosopher, Ludwig Lavater, he talked about spectrum as equating them with apparitions when he was writing in 1572. In the early 19th century, just to go on a little bit further in history, the term umbre mortuorum was used to mean the shadows of the dead, and that brought about the concept of a shadow into the vocabulary used to talk about the souls of the dead. That didn't happen until the 19th century. You'll also find that the Latin word for ghost, lava, was occasionally used in the 16th and 17th centuries to describe the spirits in the guise of the dead. There were a number of reasons why people thought ghosts would appear. First of all, where tragic deaths might occur, things like suicide, for example. Also, ghosts who continually repeated the routine of their daily lives, like a blacksmith who you could hear banging nails in over and over again. They also might appear at unconsecrated burial sites, either their own or others. They also appeared to haunt and hopefully therefore punish wrongdoers and also to play on the conscience of those who were morally deficient. A big theme was to try and right injustices and that was often why ghosts were said to appear or for revenge, particularly for murder. Sometimes in the medieval and early modern period, the talk of a ghost appearing for revenge might be used as evidence in murder trials. And also murderers themselves might appear as ghosts to confess and to try and assuage their afterlife punishments. And another big theme was to warn the living of danger. For example, in the early 1900s, a steam train traveling through Hatfield station was supposedly prevented from crashing due to a blocked track by a cold, dark phantom appearing to the driver. Historians have spent some time discussing when ghosts might appear. So traditionally, the Catholic tradition of All Saints Day and All Souls Day, which fell on the 1st and 2nd of November, known as Hallowtide, was a time linked in history with ghost appearances. However, when historians have examined the records of historical hauntings from medieval times through to the modern day, things don't really bear those timescales out. They tend to appear early in the new year, which may be associated with the fact that daylight hours are shorter at that time. Furthermore, Hallowtide was a time when church bells were rung to ward off ghosts, even after the Reformation so ghosts were possibly less likely to appear at this time. 
Ghosts did mainly appear at night time. It was thought that this was because God's light did not shine in the darkness. This was when the ungodly could appear. God had also given the devil the night, so it seemed logical that his ghosts would haunt at that time. Ghosts were reputed to take many forms. In the folklore of certain regions of Britain, particularly Scotland, Wales and Cornwall, fairies were often believed to be the souls of the dead, or at least lived amongst them, and were believed to haunt certain locations. In witchcraft trials in Scotland, cunning folk claimed to have contact with the spirits of the dead through fairies. The Boggard was a particular part of the folklore in the north of England, and as you can see from the picture, he was a kind of terrible fairy that appeared in violent death situations. One of the important things in reported ghost sightings was the attire of the ghost. Historians studying ghosts write that most tended to wear their normal clothes from their living circumstances, but that many were reported as wearing white. This might have been due to the fact that before the 19th century, the poor were buried in white shrouds as they couldn't afford coffins. These were wrapped around the body, leaving the face area exposed, as you can see from the left-hand picture. Because this white sheet outfit was easier for actors and hoaxers to utilise, ghosts in white sheets became a stereotype used in literature and folklore. There were tragic incidents where people wearing white at night were mistaken for ghosts and killed. For example, in 1804, a bricklayer, Thomas Millwood, whose uniform was white, was shot by Francis Smith. Smith was sentenced to death, but was eventually pardoned. Several white lady ghost sightings were recorded in the 19th and even early 20th centuries, often near water. This tradition evolved from the ancient belief in apparitions of fairy women and queens. The old King's Arms pub in Hemel has seen paranormal reports of a white lady on its premises, and also in Hemel, a grey lady has been seen at the Rose and Crown. Another stereotype of ghosts is the headless ghost, like the chap on the left and the picture. However, headless ghosts were less common in England than that stereotype would have us believe. The obvious association with a headless ghost is death by beheading. As most executions were hanging in England, very few headless ghosts were actually seen. Anne Boleyn is said to haunt the Tower of London, but not many of the other members of the aristocracy who were beheaded have shown themselves there. There is a supposedly headless horseman in Wiltshire who was said to have broken his neck on a fast ride, and a headless smuggler in Sussex who was shot in the head by a gamekeeper. In the early modern period, headless ghosts were sometimes associated with the Christian Day of Judgment. Theologians believed that bodies would be resurrected in full, no matter what happened to them at or after death. But ghost sightings were not always visible. For example, a drop in temperature was often reported. In 1634, a pamphlet reported that candle flames had turned blue in the presence of a spirit, and Shakespeare alluded to this blue flame superstition in his play Richard III. Also, animals were believed to have a greater sensitivity to spirits in the 18th and 19th centuries, particularly household dogs. Also, one farmer reported cows and horses being scared when passing a known haunted spot. It's said locally that animals do not dare to enter the cellar of the George pub in Hodgeston, where an invisible ghost is believed to live. Pamphlets also recorded ghosts leaving sulfurous smells. And in the 17th century, a gentlewoman reported a ghost leaving an impression in the bed in her house and an unpleasant odour. These odours were believed to be demonic odours from hell. Angels, on the other hand, were believed to give off sweet smells. And those who reported feeling the presence of departed loved ones often smelt their perfume or cigar smoke. Noises were sometimes heard, 
often those associated with the dead person's profession or manner of death. Upper class hauntings were accompanied by the sound of rustling silk dresses quite often, as you can see by the spectacular dress in the picture of Caroline Brunswick. Ghosts could also make contact. In the 19th century and onwards, ghosts rarely spoke, but in the early modern period they often did, although sometimes only if addressed first. At that time, ghosts were believed to appear in order to impart important messages, so needed to be able to speak to do this. Often it was those who had died in a horrible way or to help bring justice to an unfair situation. The capability to speak without internal organs and sometimes without a head was much debated from medieval times. Some people thought that ghosts used air, vib air vibrations Sometimes people thought they used telepathy. These were just some of the theories propounded at the time. Ghosts rarely applied pressure when touching the living. However, a 17th century pamphlet records three women as having been touched by female ghosts that felt light and cold. This could be because of the association with the body temperature of dead bodies, but also that the devil has sometimes said to be icy. However, sometimes ghosts did apply pressure. In 1716, Samuel Wellesley described having been pushed hard in his home at Epworth. And in 1802, a ghost in Cambridge had ripped up clothes of the house's inhabitants. This became an attraction and people visited to have their own clothes ripped up. The Cross Keys pub in Harpenden plays host to a fable of an unseen ghost applying pressure to the throats of sleepers. One of the most commonly reported types of ghost is the poltergeist. The word poltergeist literally means noisy ghost. It became popular in England in the late 19th and 20th centuries by psychic investigator Harry Price and consisted of haunting buildings with noise and physical energy for example, knocking and rattling. However, although they weren't called poltergeists at the time, this kind of activity was recorded in the 17th and 18th century also. Stone throwing was particularly common. In Truro in 1821, witnesses to a stone throwing haunting incident said the stone smelt of brimstone. Noisy manifestations were often blamed on witches rather than ghost activity during the height of the witch hunt activities in the 17th century. A room in the cinema at Jarman Park in Hemel has been reported as having objects flying through the air. Another form that ghosts were reported to have taken was an animal form. Occasionally animal ghosts were reported. These mainly took the form of cats, dogs or horses. For example, in 1877 in Bengio, Hertfordshire, the ghost of a dog killed three weeks prior to the sighting was seen on the common. Animal ghost sightings were often thought to be witches or fairies, angels or devils who were transformed into animals with unusual features. In 1878 in Baldock, crowds gathered blocking the road over several nights to see a small white dog with fiery eyes as big as saucers. In the early modern period, ghost dogs were believed to be diabolical. In 1584, a Somerset woman reported being attacked by a large black headless dog smelling of sulphur. Although ghost stories were folklore, they did have quite significant impact to some people. There are incidents reported of people being frightened to death from experiencing what they thought were ghosts. Fear itself was a common reaction to ghost sightings. People reported hair standing on end, pounding hearts and trembling. In 1894, an inquest on a 17 year old servant girl, Elizabeth Bishop, states that she died of fright after having reported having seen the ghost of her master's drowned brother. In 1841 in Bristol, a pub landlady testified that a drunk customer, Patrick Hayes, 
died falling down the stairs in fright after seeing the inn's ghost. The location of hauntings was often integral to the story. The dead commonly haunted the place they had died. Death often took place in the home before the 20th century and the home was also where the living slept, sometimes drunk, sometimes sick and often dreamt of the dead and that's why hauntings often were reported to take place in the home. However, bedroom hauntings were not always malign and could be comforting to those left behind. As per the second picture, the dead were also reported as haunting bridges and roads, often crossroads, and water. These places symbolised crossing boundaries of different states of being and were considered portals between the living and the dead. For example, clergymen were sometimes asked to banish ghosts under a bridge. Derelict buildings frequently got reputations as haunted houses. The feeling was that if people moved out of a man-made environment, that supernatural forces might move in. Murders that had taken place in a building could result in many reported hauntings of repeatedly appearing bloodstains. For example, in 1879, Hannah Corbridge had her throat cut by her lover, Christopher Hartley. He was executed, but when Barnside Hall, Lancashire, where he buried her body, was knocked down later, the sandstone was said to ooze with her blood. The King's Lodge pub in King's Langley has been told by a visiting psychic that the tapping noises and flickering lights that had been experienced by visitors were due to a murdered woman being buried somewhere in the walls. Churchyards were the site of many early modern hauntings, particularly where dead bodies were disturbed. The Priory Orchard in King's Langley is reputed to be haunted by ghostly monks. Unconsecrated ground was a location for haunting that was very prevalent. Ghosts of suicides were seen to either appear where they had killed themselves or at the sites of their burial. They were commonly interred in unconsecrated ground at a crossroad, often speared with a wooden stake. Parliament stopped this practice in 1823, but from the 20th century onwards, when the road network was expanded, bones were often discovered at crossroads that local inhabitants had long believed were haunted. Murderers' burials were not consecrated either. A phantom dog is said to prowl in Tring, where Thomas Colley was hanged for his part in the murder of suspected witch Ruth Osborne in 1751. Murder and accidental victims whose bodies were not found and therefore had no Christian burial were also said to hover over the location of their bodies. A lesser no location for hauntings is underground. Sites where treasure was supposed to be buried was thought to be a common site for ghosts to haunt, encouraged by popular literature of the day. Some people found themselves arrested whilst trying to dig for treasure in property owned by others that they had dreamt about. In 1871, one such person, Richard Ball, was let off by a magistrate after breaking into a property to dig for treasure that he dreamt about because he provided proof that his family had owned the site once. Rose's Hole in Friston is home to a story of a chest of gold buried that can only be dug up if the hunter is completely silent. Mines were site of haunting due to the number of deaths that occurred there, but also as their subterranean nature meant like water, they could be a portal space. In the early 20th century, Durham miners were documented that they believed ghosts of dead miners and children would appear to warn of imminent disaster. We've got three examples now of some quite well-known local historic ghost stories. The legend of Catherine Ferrers was so well known that it was made into the 1945 film The Wicked Lady, starring Margaret Lockwood and James Mason. It tells the story of a 17th century aristocratic lady who turned highway robber. Her luck ran out one night in 1660 when she held up a coach crossing Normandon's Common near Wheathampstead in Hertfordshire. 
She shot the driver, but two of the occupants of the coach were armed and shot back. She rode back to her home at Mark Yates' cell, a Tudor mansion on Watling Street, where she was found dead the following morning, still dressed as a highwayman. Residents of Mark Yates report encounters with the ghost of Catherine Ferrers, riding across the fields towards the cell and being sighted in various locations around the village. Her ghost is also said to haunt Normans Common. In 1970, the landlord of the Wicked Lady pub on Normans Common was walking his dog and heard horses' hooves louder and louder as he stood looking around him in the darkness. The sound grew suddenly deafening and then faded as the rider passed by him, so close that he could smell the horse's sweat, but didn't see either horse or rider. Knowing the legends concerning the common, he assumed he had just had a close shave with the ghost of Lady Catherine. How she came to be identified as a notorious highway robber is a mystery. Mark Yates' cell was indeed owned by the Ferrers family, and Catherine may well have lived there for a time. However, it was leased to tenants after her father's death and sold in 1655, five years before Catherine's death, so it seems highly unlikely that she died there. In fact, it is most likely she died at Ware Park, probably of natural causes, for she was buried at St Mary's Church in Ware on the 13th of June 1660, although not in the Fanshawe family vault, which some have suggested hints at wrongdoing. Another famous ghost story is the tale of Robert Snook. Robert Snook was the last man to be executed in England for highway robbery on March the 11th, 1802. Born in Hungerford in Berkshire, he was christened as James Snook on the 16th of August 1761. The fact that his name is commonly quoted as Robert Snooks is perhaps due to a corruption of his identity as the Robber Snook. On the evening of Sunday the 10th of May 1801, postboy John Stevens, travelling from Tring to Hemel, was threatened by a highwayman at Boxmoor, who stole £80 from the post bags. He also discarded his saddle with a broken girth strap on the moor, a mistake that would cost the highwayman his downfall. James Snook was already a wanted man in connection with several highway robberies and had been indicted for horse stealing at the Old Bailey in 1799, which the middle picture shows his indictment. For this charge he was acquitted due to a lack of firm evidence. A reward of £200 was offered by the Postmaster General and a further £100 by Parliament for the capture of the highwayman, which occurred in December. He was transferred to Hartford Jail on the 4th of March 1802, whilst awaiting trial. He was tried five days later and hanged two days after that near the scene of the crime. Thousands witnessed the hanging, where Snooks is reputed to have exclaimed, it's no good hurrying, they can't start the fun until I get there, whilst on his way to the gallows. Snook's body was dug up the day after his hanging and interred in a coffin provided by the residents of Hemel Hempstead. A small headstone bearing the name Robert Snooks was erected by the Boxmore Trust in 1904, whilst a footstone was installed in 1994 as part of the Trust's 400 year anniversary. The exact location of Snook's hanging and subsequent burial is unknown, so the location of the stones is an approximation. Dancing around his grave twelve times is said to summon his spirit to join the dance. I have already mentioned Thomas Coley, but as his story is so important, it's worth going through in a bit more detail. As you'll know if you've heard the witch hunting half of this talk, Witch hunting was made illegal by the Witchcraft Act of 1736, but these traditions proved hard to eradicate. In 1751, a mob from Tring, Hemel and surrounding areas were summoned by the notice on the left-hand side of this slide and ducked suspected Tring witch Ruth Osborne and her husband. She died from this ducking and the authorities decided to make an example of the ringleaders. Thomas Coley had turned her over with a stick in the water several times and was seen by the authorities as the ringleader. He was convicted and hanged at Gubblecote Gallows, 
and at his hanging the crowds were angry that he had been punished for killing in their view an evil witch and he was seen as a bit of a martyr. Clergy who attended executions, called ordinaries, worked hard to scare felons that they would go to hell if they did not confess their sins and denounce the belief in witches. Thomas Coley's confession on the right hand side of this slide does just that. It says, good people, I beseech you all to take warning by an unhappy man's suffering, that you not be deluded into so absurd and wicked a conceit as to believe that there are any such beings upon earth as witches. He is said to haunt the spot where he was hung in the form of a huge black dog with yellow fangs.